Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about the therapy of hot flashes. Just to review, hot flashes often begin in the latter part of a woman's reproductive years while she's still having her periods. So it's the premenopausal years, and then they become gradually more severe, more frequent, more intense during the perimenopause when the hormones are fluctuating, and then finally they disappear several years after the last period, after the menopause. Well, 85% of women are going to have symptoms at least daily during this time period. One in three women are going to have symptoms at least 10 times a day. Average duration of these symptoms, the hot flashes, five or six years. Hot flashes tend to occur on the head and neck, the upper chest, the upper back, associated with heat, oftentimes intense. The feeling that you're flushing, that somebody may or may not be able to see. The sweating, that oftentimes is profuse. Each attack lasts from one to five or ten minutes. They can be moderate or severe. Sometimes women only have mild symptoms that they don't even recognize. The average number per day, seven or eight attacks. Sometimes they're infrequent. Sometimes it could be more than 20 times a day. The reason for the hot flash is the brain, the hypothalamus, establishes a zone where the temperature has to be. If you get above that zone, you will sweat. If you get below that zone, you will shiver. That's what we call the thermoneutral zone. Now, not all hot flashes are due to menopause. You could have them from anxiety, maybe hyperthyroidism, overactive thyroid, maybe hypoglycemia, maybe you uh, ate too much monosodium glutamate, or you took a medicine for your blood pressure. Estrogen withdrawal seems to be critical, but it might not be necessary because it seems if we measure the estrogen concentration in the blood in women with and without hot flashes, it's exactly the same. And remember, young girls, four or five or six, who don't have any estrogen also don't have hot flashes. It would appear that there's a chemical that the brain makes or that the sympathetic nervous system makes, and it's known as noradrenaline or norepinephrine, and that might be the key to controlling that thermoneutral zone. Now, the first step, no matter what the cause is, is wear some lightweight clothes, dress in cotton, sit around the fan or an air conditioner, try to have cool or cold beverage, avoid hot and spicy foods. If you exercise, that's going to increase your body temperature, so do in expect to increase the amount of perspiration. If you lose weight, well, the fat is an insulator. So if you lose weight, chances are your symptoms will be less severe. There are some cognitive therapies and behavioral modification therapies that seem to work. Progressive muscle relaxation might help some. Slow breathing, what's known as paced diaphragmatic respiration that you can teach yourself seems to help quite a bit, seems to reduce the amount of noradrenaline that's being produced, and in doing so, seems to lessen the severity of the symptoms. Some people can achieve a similar goal by biofeedback. Now, if you have moderate to severe symptoms of these hot flashes, if you still have your uterus intact, you need to take estrogen and progesterone. If your uterus has been removed, you've had a hysterectomy, then you just need the estrogen. You have to weigh the potential benefit versus the potential harm. You want to take the smallest dose for the shortest period of time. Typically, that's going to be either a pill or a transdermal patch. Most women received hormone replacement therapy prior to 2002 when the Women's Health Initiative was published. And it showed quite clearly that the combination of estrogen and progesterone increased the risk of breast cancer. Obviously, you want to avoid that. Well, that was in women who were taking relatively long-term therapy. What about short-term therapy? Is short-term therapy safe? Well, it would appear that it may well be, especially if you use the patch, because the patch goes direct to the bloodstream when you take the pill. The pill 
gets absorbed from the intestine and goes directly to the liver where it's going to be changed. Anytime you take a drug, there's a potential side effect. So if you happen to take estrogen, side effects would include breast tenderness and bloating and maybe some uterine bleeding. Well, before you even consider whether estrogen would be appropriate for you, you have to gauge your heart's health. And you do that by a calculator that you can get from the American Heart Association online or the American College of Cardiology. And if you happen to have a 10% risk over the following 10 years of having a cardiovascular event, then these drugs aren't for you. On the other hand, a low-dose therapy as long as you're not at risk for breast cancer, a low-dose therapy for a period of five to 10 years in women who are in their 50s tends to be very well tolerated. And in fact, if we look at the absolute risk of breast cancer over a period of therapy with hormones for hot flashes, we find that the incidence of breast cancer, if you take the estrogen and the progesterone together, is a little bit increased. But if you take the estrogen by itself, it actually might be borderline decreased. Well, that's obviously good to know. So how much is the risk? If you take the estrogen, what's the risk that you might actually increase the likelihood you get breast cancer? The answer is it's about the same as drinking a glass of wine a day. So it's very small risk. Now, it's also important to realize that women who have some sort of dyslipidemia, in other words, you have high cholesterol, you have high triglycerides, or you have what's known as a metabolic syndrome, well, maybe you want to skip the estrogens. How about the bioidentical hormones? You hear so much about them. They're custom-made to a doctor's prescription. The term means, obviously, it's got to be natural. It's got to be something that's produced by nature, and it actually is from a, a plant, and it's chemically modified. But somewhere around 2.5 million women use the bioidentical hormones. They're advocated by celebrities. They're not approved by the Food and Drug Administration, and all claims regarding how safe they are and how effective they are and how they're superior to the standard prescriptions, there is no basis for any of that. Bioidentical hormones are not standardized. We have no idea of the potency, and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology says there's no evidence behind it. If you want to take a hormone therapy, go and take a standard prescription. The idea about adding testosterone doesn't seem to work. Progesterone? Well, now that's very interesting. Certainly there are a variety of forms of progesterone, and the progesterone was used in the Women in the Women's Health Initiative, and it was found that you could decrease the incidence of hot flashes with the progesterone by somewhere around 85%. Now you can take the progesterones on a continuous basis every day, low dose, or you could take it cyclically for just 10 to 14 days a month. If you take them continuously, you get some breakthrough bleeding originally, but then over the months and years, that stops. But if you take them cyclically, you do the 10 or 14 days a month, then chances are you will have periodic shedding of the lining of the uterus, and then you'll have a period. Well, the progesterone that was used was the medroxyprogesterone acetate, or you could get the shot that's commonly used as a birth control, or you could use it as a cream. But anytime you use the progesterone, and the reason it's a little bit controversial, is it might increase the risk of breast cancer a bit. There's another option, an option that was very popular once upon a time, now considerably less, but something to consider if you can't take the estrogen would be clonidine. Clonidine reduces the norepinephrine so it widens that thermoneutral zone and then is associated with a decreased incidence of hot flashes. Well, if you take it by mouth, it would appear that you can reduce the likelihood of hot flashes by about 40%, maybe in some women by 80% with the transdermal patch side effects, of course, just like with any other kind of medicine. It could cause dry mouth or sedation. It's used as a blood pressure medicine, so it could make your blood pressure go down. It could cause you to be constipated. Well, overall... 
the studies over a period of time have been less favorable for clonidine than the original studies were. So is it really better than a placebo? For some women it is, yes. The serotonin drugs, you've heard of those selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the medicines that are used to treat depression, might be very good in the treatment of menopausal symptoms, hot flashes. Indeed, women who have menopausal symptoms typically have some mood disturbances and it would appear that Paxil at a low dose, 7.5 milligrams a day, not the psychiatric dose, not the 20 to 40 milligrams a day, but a very low dose, a dose that you can just stop instead of if you were taking the psychiatric dose, you'd have to taper off. But the Food and Drug Administration has said okay, and this is an authorized treatment. And if you take the Paxil, it could reduce the likelihood of hot flashes by somewhere around 60 or 70 percent, considerably more than with a placebo. Now, not all SSRIs are alike. Prozac hasn't been tested officially. Zoloft hasn't been tested officially. There's been some studies with some effects, or it's not an FDA-approved drug, but at a dose of 75 milligrams of the extended release pill a day, you could reduce the likelihood of hot flashes again by about 60%. At a lower dose, at half of the dose, 37.5 milligrams, you might have a 35% improvement. One third of the women might get better. Symptoms associated with taking the effects are, well, you might have some insomnia, you might have some sleepiness, you might have a dry mouth. Then there are other antidepressants. Lexapro really hasn't been studied. Now, just like with aclonidine, more and more studies come out and there's a little bit more question about whether they really work, but they're relatively low risk. So remember, we have the Paxil, 7.5 milligrams a day. We have the estrogen that you can take by mouth or by patch. And then there's something called bezidoxaphine. And this medicine is what's known as a CIRM. It's sort of like the Avista that you hear about. And when combined with an estrogen, the conjugated estrogens, it seems to be quite helpful and it's marketed as an FDA approved product. Now they happen to find gabapentin, that's an anticonvulsant that's used for all sorts of things. And accidentally it was determined that it might in some women reduce the incidence of hot flashes. Now it is not FDA approved for the purpose and works as infrequently as 35% of the time, which is basically a placebo, or as often as 70% of the time. But again, as with everything else, there are always side effects, make you have a little difficulty walking, maybe some dizziness, maybe some tiredness. Then there are a lot of isoflavones and botanicals that people take. According to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, just don't use them because there's no data. North American Menopause Society says, the data is really indecisive one way or another, but it's okay to use them. The American Association for Clinical Endocrinologists says they're marginal benefit at best, and that includes vitamin E and soy and red clover. Black cohosh doesn't seem to do anything, and there's no real good evidence that Chinese herbs or natural progestins or Don K or omega-3 or genistein or datecine or primrose oil or ginseng or licorice or wild yam, even evening primrose oil, no data to support that those are effective. Flaxseed oil, no good evidence. Some people like yoga, that's okay if it seems to work, fine. The idea about using androgens, again, nope, they just don't work. Remember, if you're going to use a bioidentical hormone, not FDA approved, and as a matter of fact, even though millions of women using it, looked upon by organized experts in the area as being an inferior therapy, some people have tried Lyrica, a whole bunch of other drugs, no evidence to support them, but we do know among those women given a placebo, 40 to 50 percent are going to improve. So unfortunately, you know all we know currently about treating hot flashes. Hopefully, we'll have a better answer soon, and when we do, I'm going to bring it to you. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.
Thank you.